You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and Snarky Faith is a radio show for the spiritually disenfranchised. If you've had enough of the insanity in Christianity, you've come to the right place. Here at Snarky Faith, we're about finding sane faith that's grounded in reality and working to make the world a better place in tangible ways. This isn't a safe zone for spiritual escapism, Sunday school answers, or Christianese. And we're here to call out religious BS and look for better ways forward. If you can handle conversations about faith with copious amounts of sarcasm and also a bit of then you've come to the right place. Welcome home. On today's show, we're going to be sitting down with the makers of the documentary Postcards from Babylon. But before we descend into all the fun and snark, a few quick bits of housekeeping. This broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at www.snarkyfaith.com and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube. We're there. Just look for us. Look for Snarky Faith. And if you like the show, make sure to subscribe. And if you're feeling particularly generous, drop a review over on iTunes, too. It helps to get the word out to new listeners. And hey, I personally appreciate it. And if you want to interact more with the show, you can find the Snarky Faith page on Facebook. Drop me a line at questions at snarkyfaith.com. And there's even a snarky hotline if you want to leave a message that most likely will end up on the air. Well, that number is 919-525-1570. Again, the snarky hotline is 919-525-1570. Well, some sad news today as we begin the show because we're not going to have any Christian crazy because I feel like we've had enough Christian crazy for a while, but the segment will probably return next week. But after the siege on the government, yes, we've had enough Christian craziness. We've had enough. We've had enough. And as I begin the show, I wanted just to start off with some words uh, from an article over on The Atlantic called A Christian Insurrection by Emma Green. And I feel like this article speaks very well to where we are at. And it begins like this. The name of God was everywhere during Wednesday's insurrection against the American government. The mob carries signs and a flag declaring, Jesus saves! And God, guns, and guts made America. Let's keep all three. Some were participants of the Jericho March a gathering of Christians to pray, march, and fast, and rally for election integrity. After calling to God to save the republic during rallies at the state capitals and in D.C. over the past two months, marchers returned to Washington with a flourish. On the National Mall, one man waved a flag of Israel above a sign begging passerbys to say yes to Jesus. Shout if you love Jesus, some yelled. And the crowd cheered, shout if you love Trump. The crowd cheered louder. The group's name is drawn from biblical, the biblical story of Jericho, where, quote, Jericho was a city of false gods and corruption. And just as God instructed Joshua to march around Jericho seven times with the priests blowing trumpets, Christians gathered in D.C. blowing shofars, a ram's horn typically used in Jewish worship to banish the darkness of election fraud and ensure that the walls of corruption crumble. The Jericho March is evidence that Donald Trump has bent elements of American Christianity to his will and that many Christians have obligingly remade their faith in his image. Defiant masses literally broke down the walls of government, some believing they were marching under Jesus' banner to implement God's will to keep Trump in the White House. Yeah. 
They helped to stage a stunning effort to circumvent the 2020 election, and all in the name of their faith. White evangelicals in particular overwhelmingly supported Trump in 2016 and 2020. And some of these supporters participated in the attack on the Capitol on Wednesday. But many in the country hold all Trump voters responsible, especially those who lent him the moral authority of their faith. So yeah, that happened. And I don't want to spend time on the show doing a very big I told you so, because we've been talking about this since 2015 on the radio, about how this kind of stuff's going to happen. I'm not going to waste time on doing that. I'm not going to waste time on doing a big I told you so with that because it's stupid. It's stupid. Because really where we need to be in a place is we need to be in a spot to be able to move forward. How do we move on from this? How do we continue on within this? And, and the thing that bothers me the most, nay, I say pisses me off the most, is the call to kind of just smooth this over and run really quickly towards unity and peace. And my beef with this, and which is tending to piss people off that <laughs> know me on Facebook right now, is that there is, we should not be rushing away from this. We should not be running away from blame on this because there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot that needs to happen before we even move towards this idea called unity. I thought Shane Claiborne uh, tweeted this out earlier, I, I believe it was last week, and, and, and it it really just fits to what we need to be doing now. And he says it goes like this. He said this. It goes in this order. First, truth comes before repentance. And repentance comes with reparations and accountability. Repentance comes before reconciliation. And reconciliation comes before unity. And my issue with running towards unifying and just being able to scapegoat and say, these guys are bad, these guys are bad. I mean, we know Trump's bad. I mean, that's nothing new. But before we try to scapegoat and bury this under the rug, one of the grand gifts that Trump has given us has been the ability to kind of pick up that rock of culture and look what's underneath it. If we thought as an American nation, look, we've done well, civil rights, we've moved on, we are living in a free society where the playing field is level, yes, no, we're not there. Trump has given us the gift of perspective in the negative form of us being able to see all of our lesser angels. It was Abraham Lincoln who famously said, we must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory will swell when again touched, and as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. But right now, it really kind of feels like we're working with the lesser angels or probably just America's demons, uh, if we want to be able to talk about that honestly. America, we've got a lot of healing to do, and I don't think we need to move on quickly from it. I think we need to meditate on it. I think we need to realize where we've been a problem and a part in it. I think this is kind of a time that we need to spend reflecting on how to make it better. Now, within that time, we need to also make sure that people are held accountable for things. But it's upon us. It's upon us to make this better. And I figure there is no better conversation for us to have today uh, than with the makers of the upcoming documentary, Postcards from Babylon, a documentary centered around the problem of Christian nationalism in America today. Ooh, yeah, it's happening right now. So let's go ahead and get to it. Let's go. So Postcards from Babylon is a documentary featuring author and pastor Brian Zahn as he investigates possibly the most important question for the church in North America today, a church often characterized by Christian nationalism, that question is, how does the church stay faithful to the beautiful ways of Jesus while situated in one of the most divisive political climates in our nation's history today? And today we're talking with, we've got Brian Zahn, we've got David and Kathy Peters, the directors of this film. So welcome, welcome. Thank uh, you. Everyone. Great to be here. Hey, sure. Good to be here. So I know, Brian, you wrote the book Postcards in Babylon back in 2000, or at least came out in 2019. 
Now, how did you guys go from, and anyone can hop in with this, how did you guys go from, I wrote a book, to let's make a documentary about this book? <laughs> That's going to be for David to answer. I just wrote a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Kathy and I have been following Brian for about five, well, about six years now. We heard about him in 2015. I was able to read a manuscript of a book. And um, so um, we'd been listening to his teaching, was very drawn to it. And then in 2019, Postcards from Babylon came out. And as I was reading it, toward the end of the book, he referenced the fact that he wanted to be able to tell his grandchildren that during this time he spoke up and he said something. Um, and as I read that, I mean, immediately I was drawn to his conviction to do that and that he would write a whole book and that he would self publish it so it could get out quickly. Um, so I just felt an inclination there in early in 2019 that I'd like to make a documentary about it. Thought about it for a while. We were finishing up a film on St. Patrick that we were producing. And then early in the summer, I reached out to Brian. We had emailed a couple times in the past and said I would told him I'd like to make a, a documentary about it and kind of what it would look like. So he invited us to come join him on the Camino de Santiago that he was on in October and that we could spend a few days together talking about the project and kind of getting to know one another. And, you know, because we were basically going to make a film based on his title, his brand, his name. And I, I remember thinking that's kind of a big ask. Um, but I asked anyway. And I think once we spent some time with him on the Camino, I, I think he figured we were kind of somewhat OK people. And <laughs> we enjoyed getting to know him and walking and talking. And, and it was great to um, ask Brian a question and and then listen to these incredible answers as we were as we were walking through the Spanish countryside. So yeah, so that's kind of how the project came to be. Um, COVID just about derailed the whole thing because we were scheduled to do a lot of shooting in the spring and all of that was shut down, but we pers uh, persevered. We were gonna try to release it before the election, but then things changed and now we're releasing it the day after the inauguration. Mm. Which now that I think about it is maybe the best time for this film. Absolutely. Especially when we're talking about how, how polarized and fractured we are as, as a country where we still have a fair amount of people within our populace that believe that the election is not over somehow. Mm -hmm. um, people kind of living in fairyland, but, uh, but they continue to persist as well. So, so you guys, you guys start with this, you're filming and, and some of this, uh, at least when my understanding is this, some of the, the hike and some of the time you guys spent together on the Camino, that's part of the, part of some of the backdrop of this documentary, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Kathy, why don't you answer that? Yes, that's correct. We, we just felt like, um, in a sense, the, the journey that the American church is on could be mirrored by the concept of, of Brian and Perry, his wife Perry, walking the Camino. And we mm -hmm. felt that that would provide a nice, um, not only a nice backdrop with the beautiful scenery, but also the whole idea of the fact that we are on this journey trying to figure out how we are the most beautiful representatives, ambassadors of Christ in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just felt like the Camino would, would be a great representation of that. People know mm -hmm. what the Camino is. Yes. You know, the Camino, it's the Camino de Santiago. Mm -hmm. It's an ancient pilgrim route. The Camino de Norte or the Camino de Santiago Francais that's the standard route. It's a it's a 500 mile walk from Saint Jean Pied de Port France to Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Uh, Perry and I have now walked it three times. <laughs> that was our third time, and and David and Kathy, they you walked with us for what four days? Four days. You yeah. like you walked like a tenth of the Camino. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so yeah, what, what, yeah. Are, what are you? Are you getting like into like? Are we hike bragging right now about who did more? Yeah. Is that what this is? I can tell you, they would they would love nothing more than to do the whole thing. They would <laughs> that would be a sheer joy for David and Kathy. I'm I'm sure I'm right on that. That is on my bucket list. Yeah. And we didn't we didn't we didn't rough it like when I had watched documentaries about walking the Camino. I saw these hostels that you stay in where you're in a room with like 16 people. And, but fortunately, Brian and Perry kind of do the three or four star yeah, journey. We did that. We're staying in little nicer hotels. You know, staying in the albergues with, 
what, whatever. And, and that, that lost its luster. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we walk as, as true peregrinos during the day and then we stay in, you know, decent accommodations. <laughs> right. Now, I was going to ask initially, but I think I was curious about this, Brian. So if you have you've done this several times with your wife, that that in itself is kind of like marriage therapy. If you're walking 500 miles together, um, mm. I don't know what's what's more difficult, that or doing a film together. Um, I don't know how we would wrestle that out between David you know, and Kathy. I'll tell you a story from our first. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, Perry and I, my wife, Perry and I, we walked for. <laughs> this is this is not an exaggeration. We walked for 499 miles without a fight. And we got in a fight on the last mile. <laughs> mm. Perry, Perry tells it, Perry wrote a book on this, on you know, the whole Camino. And it's my fault. But what happened, we're, we're, we're different people. And I didn't really understand it. I, on that last day, you know, we've been walking for 40 days. And, and I want to get there, you know, like. The, the accomplishment, Perry loved the Camino so much, she didn't want it to be over. Mm. And so we're within one mile of the cathedral <laughs> and she wants to stop and have lunch. I said, let's walk one mile. <laughs> 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 we got this big fight about whether we were gonna stop and have lunch or anyway. Well, they were certainly doing better than us because the entire time that Dave and I have done this documentary, we've been fighting. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um yeah so <laughs> sorry no well, maybe the, not the entire time but well, I, yeah, not I the mean, entire this, time this is, um yeah i mean it, it's a controversial film mm -hmm. and we've never really done something quite like this and trying to decide what elements we would we would cover in the film i mean you know key to the story in postcards from babylon is is you know christian nationalism mm -hmm. civil religion uh, militarism is is heavily covered um and you know when you start talking about christians in the military and critiquing that and christians being involved in redemptive violence um you're really stepping in and this is whether you're talking to republicans or democrats mm -hmm. this is sacred ground when you're critiquing america's military actions and so we really struggled with how to communicate that. And, and we feel like we found a way to, to couch it, contextualize it in a story uh, about a veteran. And so as we're learning from Brian as a prophet, we're also seeing a soldier and hearing about their particular story. And, you know, personally, I feel like, and we spent a lot of time figuring out how to put that together, but I feel like that's in my, in my mind, that's the, my favorite part of the film because it's, um, we synthesized two things together um, and it was, yeah, but yeah, coming up with how to approach this film, there were so many directions we could go. Should we talk about racism or not? That wasn't a, a significant portion of Brian's book at all, but it seems like in 2020, yeah. that subject emerged front and center in a way. And of course, as you look at empire and the abuse of empire and the abuse of Christian empire, slavery and systemic racism is right there at the top of the list, so. And it seems like this happened at a good time also to where, I mean, I know Brian, you were saying, or I think I'd read that you were on the Camino mainly to get your head right for the, the 2020 election cycle. And I think this, this election cycle, okay, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, Brian. Was this more than you expected it to be? It's all been more than I expected. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in, in one sense, I've never considered, I've never self-identified as an evangelical. I just always saw myself as like a Jesus freak, charismatic. Mm -hmm. Evangelicals were like Baptists and that wasn't me, but I've been fully immersed in that world. I know it as well as anyone. And if someone had told me, if someone had described the phenomenon of Christian support of Trumpism, let's say 2014, and I, you know, I'm, I was writing and critiquing Christian nationalism at that time. I would not have believed it. I just wouldn't have believed it. In 2016, we walked the Camino de Santiago because I wanted to be away from it. Mm -hmm. I just thought, okay, I can't go through this madness again. And so we get away from it. People say, well, why didn't you then do it in 2020? Mm -hmm. You know, plan to do it. I mean, obviously now we know why, because you couldn't have, if you, even if you wanted to, but we didn't plan to because I thought, no, this time around, I've got to be here. I can't just 
you know, for my own sake, be off, off in, off in Spain walking 500 miles. And so we did it the year before. And it really was. I, th I thought, okay, I need to kind of bring myself into a more contemplative space. Everything's reactionary right now. And if I'm not careful, I'll wade into those waters and I'll just be another reactionary. And I didn't want to be that. So um, it's hard to describe how therapeutic walking for 500 miles, especially on a sacred path, can be. But it does bring you into a different kind of place, a different uh, disposition, I'm trying to find the right word, a different I don't know, you just settle into kind of a, a more contemplative stance. And so that was part of my preparation before returning to the fray that I knew was going to be vitriolic and pretty bad in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have a congregation to pastor both locally and kind of through media and, and I wanted to be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Now for David and Kathy, what, um, in your minds, who is this? Uh, who is this documentary? Who is the audience? Like, who are we speaking to in this? Like, who are who are you wanting to get eyeballs on the screen with this? Kathy, why don't you take a stab at that first? Oh wow, <laughs> this is one of this those. This is something we thought about. Yeah, yeah. This was, you know, initially. Who is this film for? Yeah, initially, Stuart. Kind of what we were thinking was that there's this, again assuming that the film was going to come out before the election, we looked at people kind of on a spectrum. So you've got on one end of the spectrum, you've got these, the Trump supporters, the kind of hard line, no matter what happens, we support him. And at the very opposite end of that, you have this group of people that who actually ended up being the target audience who have resonated with the message of Brian's book mm -hmm. and inevitably the the message of this film and so then we looked at the fact that there were people kind of on a sliding scale in the middle of all of that and we kind of started targeting the group of people who were probably one level in from being totally supportive of uh trump and and what was going on in that particular camp feeling like there were probably some people who were supporters but they, they had a check in their spirit, as my sister-in-law would say. It's like, mm, I, I support, but mm, maybe this isn't quite where I should be going. So that, that was kind of where we started. Mm -hmm. But as the film began to play itself out in David's editing suite, we realized that there's probably not a lot of people that are willing to change their minds. So mm -hmm. maybe if we aim more for people who resonate with this message and then allow them to see it on the big screen and say, wow, this would be something that I can now maybe pass on to someone who might be more open to hearing this message. Hmm. So that's kind of our ultimate plan. Would you agree, David? Kathy, that's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she explained it really well. Yeah, I mean, because it kind of ultimately is we figured we're making this for people who are ready to hear it. Um, because there was a point in my life where I would have, in fact, I say this in the film that I would have never, never made this film, you know, let alone watched it. Um, but there was a moment in time when I was handed a book, The Myth of a Christian Nation. There was a moment in time when I was handed Brian's book, Farewell to Mars. And it was like at that mo moment in time, I was ready to hear the message. So we feel like there's people that are ready to hear this, you know, by the thousands. And of course, people are leaving the church and often a core reason of that is how evangelicals and how their churches are engaging in politics and an emerging generation says, we just don't want to have anything to do with that. And I, it grieves me to think people are walking away. And so if this film can be there to say, yes, there's people that are trying to follow Jesus that are critiquing this, you know, hold on, you know, there's another, there's another way to be mm -hmm. and check this out, listen to this message. So and oftentimes, even resources like this, either through books or through documentaries, it's I, I've always found them helpful sometimes to put my feelings into words, um, mm -hmm. oftentimes to be able to give me words to articulate the things I, oh, yes, I've been thinking about. That. You know, I mm -hmm. do that a lot oftentimes with Brian's books. I'd be like, oh, that, that's so much more concise than what was gobbledygook was in my brain. Yes. Um, and so, right. you know, you put it out and it's and it gets it's easier for you to be able to spread it, to to be able to talk about that. Now, one mm -hmm. of the core ideas in the book, Brian, um, is that 
that Christianity must be subversive or else that it's, it's, it's been compromised. Um, for those that haven't read your book, can you give us like a, a few examples of that? Well, <clears throat> Jesus Christ in his ministry did one thing. He announced and enacted the kingdom of God. Now I say that and people go, okay, what does that mean? Well, it's God's alternative for the way the world is arranged. There's the world as it is, and then there is the radical alternative that Jesus Christ offers and that we that are the baptized are confessed to live. Um, the early Christians, when they said Jesus is Lord, this carried dangerous political implications. First of all, Lord was an imperial title granted to the Caesar by the Senate. So when Christians say Jesus is Lord, they are at least by implication saying, and Caesar is not. These Christians were content to live within the empire, pay taxes, not stage revolutions, not live not resort to violence, but they never saw themselves as really a part of it. So they were conspicuous, for example, in their absence at the various pagan holidays, which were part of the civil religion that kind of, you know, was cohesive, that held the society together. And they would have their, their civil religious rights and the Christians weren't there. It, it's, it's akin to not standing up for the national anthem. Mm -hmm. Everybody stands up. Uh, the Christians weren't protesting it. They weren't saying, but they just, they weren't there. They weren't, to say it this way, they weren't there standing with their hand over their heart. And they were noticed, well, where are these people? Well, we have pledged our allegiance to another king and another kingdom. We confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, we're not trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. We have renounced violence. We're no threat to you. But we are neither are we going to participate in anything that would compromise our absolute radical fidelity to Christ. Now, I'm just I'm just telling this in the in the sense of a historical observation about what the early church was like, but it doesn't take too much extrapolation to say, oh, if people live like that today, that would be controversial, that would be subversive. Uh, people say, okay, well, our empire wages wars, but we don't support it. Our empire says that we are going to prioritize our own national well-being above any other nation. And Christian says, no, uh, we belong to a global body of Christ. And for God so loved the world, not one particular nation state, so that we are equally committed to the human flourishing and well-being of all nations, not one over against another. Uh, all of those things immediately become controversial when we are suspicious of um, being able to shape the world through violence, when we uh, believe that the Sermon on the Mount might actually be something we are intended to live and to embody. Um, I think in one of my books, I think it's in Farewell to Mars, I, I, I invite the reader into a thought experiment. Imagine Jesus being invited to address a joint session of Congress, you know, and you can imagine, oh, it's Jesus, so they're going to, all the senators and the congressmen are there, and he's given a formal introduction, and they, oh, he gets a standing ovation, right, and, and I'm not going to try to put words in Jesus' mouth, so I just say, and imagine that Jesus' address is exactly what we find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, early on, there might be a, a few polite, you know, hand claps, and then, and then these senators and congressmen are getting nervous, and they're looking at the corner of their eyes, and when Jesus starts talking about, do not resist the one who is evil, uh, yeah. so the, the idea that there is a nice, easy, non-contradictory possibility of a conflation of the American agenda and the kingdom of Christ is sheer fantasy, and ever so often, someone comes along and tells you that that's fantasy, that if we're going to live out of our baptismal identity, there will be moments when we are seen as subversive and dangerous and disruptive 
within the larger society, even though we don't have any intention of direct overthrow. We're simply just living a different way. I don't know. No, it's beautiful. I love I love how that's laid out. And I, and I went through the whole process that you guys all kind of journeyed through with this. Uh, and this is for everybody, too. I, I've, I've got a hard question. Um, after I've, you know, for me, being a person who's watched uh, 2016 turn to 2020 and all the insanity that's happened in between, um, is evangelicalism worth saving? Hmm. I don't know if it's worth saving. I think it's a lost cause. I'm being, I'm being real blunt. I, I do a lot of podcasts. I get asked this a lot. And I just think it's not going to disappear because it's, it's, it's large. It's certainly the most visible face of public Christianity in America. Mm-hmm. But I think it's made evangelism impossible. Mm-hmm. I think they, they will continue to operate within their own base they will necessarily become more insular and that it's a great tragedy that a movement that has within its name, the evangel. Yes. You know, so they're, they're committed to evangelism. Mm -hmm. They have now made evangelism essentially impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, Right before I started uh, doing this podcast, I got a, an email coincidentally, from a man that I met on the Camino. I'm not going to give his whole name, but his first name is Evan. He's a um, university professor in the realm of religion. And we just, we came across, he's from Nashville, I believe. And he and his wife were spending, were at that time spending a year in Europe. They called it their gap year. I think they were getting ready to retire, something like that. And they're about our age, they're in their 60s. And they were walking the Camino. And as it happens, we just, we encountered one another. And we walk together for several days. You know, you can get to know somebody, walk with them for six hours a day for five days and talk with them. And um, Evan is an agnostic, a thoughtful man. We, did, we didn't talk much about faith for the first few days, and then, it, then we got there. And out of the blue today, I got an email from him. I wasn't expecting this at all, that he had read postcards from Babylon. And he was effusive in, in his praise of it. And he said, I'm not a believer. I'm an agnostic, but if I were to ever be a Christian, I'd be a Christian like that. I'd be, the, I'd be that kind of Christian. And then went on and said, so I'd like to know. I have some questions about Christian faith. And suddenly he's open. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is those kind of people are unreachable by evangelicals right now. Yes. So they, they have made themselves odious. Uh, thoughtful people have seen through it. They say... This is nothing more than the religious wing of a particular partisan party, mm-hmm. a partisan politics. I mean, if, if they're somewhat, you know, just paying attention over the last few decades, they know this is the group of people that used to say character counts, and all of a sudden they decided character doesn't count. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, their sermons were character counts, and then they were, mm, character doesn't count. <laughs> what counts is whatever, you know, yeah. power, power. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I could... so I'm pretty bleak and I'm not bleak on the church. You know, I, 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 Jesus will shine through and there'll be people that will be serious about discipleship and there's hope. But as far as evangelicalism is understood, I think to, in my mind, and this is just an opinion, it's reached the point where it can be labeled a failed experiment. I, th- mm. I think it's just a failed experiment. Mm. Mm. Now, now, I, I, when I asked the I question, Kathy that. did. Kathy, you did one of those, hmm, when I asked that question. And so I'm curious, uh, what is behind that? There was something there. Kathy had something going. Do you have anything? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, Brian's really hit the nail on the head when he said the word odious. I mean, that mm. word, the, even the word odious is odious. So <laughs> <laughs> when I think about that, I mean, that's a, something's odious. That's a foul stench. And if, if that's how evangelicals are being perceived, then Brian's right. I, it, and your question is, is very pertinent. Is it, is it worth being saved? Mm-hmm. So if not, to me, the, the exact opposite of odious is, is beautiful. And mm-hmm. beauty is what's going, as Brian says, beauty will change the world. Maybe. And I think what Brian exemplified for Evan was a more beautiful way 
to be Jesus. And that's attractive. Hmm. Well, people are, people are looking and, and they're watching. And Kathy and I went to a Trump rally back in, when was that? February, Kathy, last year? Yes. Um, and it was, you know, we got there like five hours earlier thinking we could get right in. Well, there were people lined up. This was in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And it was the day before the impeachment um, hearing was to be announced and the results. So people were there, you know, there was probably, I think it seated like 15,000 people and there was probably 10,000 that didn't get in, including us. Mm -hmm. So we were mingling and talking with Trump supporters, um, which was very interesting. I mean, we had good conversations. They were friendly, courteous people. But then we had heard there was a, a protest somewhere on the in the parking lot and they separated these two parties the supporters and the protesters by probably a mile and it took me like 20 minutes just to find them so you had these protesters you had the people attending the rally completely separated from each other and it was kind of a um a spatial demonstration of what's going on is no one's really listening to each other and there's good people there's, they were good people. And I, I spent time talking with some Trump supporters and they were you know, kind, interesting people. Although it was interesting, once the rally started, he came up on the big screen. All of a sudden it was kind of like a vaudeville act where people were booing and hissing. And these people that we were just with were kind of being fomented into a, a, a rather kind of ugly crowd. Then I went over to the demonstrators and that's what was so interesting for me because they were, you know, again, it was about the impeachment at that time and, and they were chanting, you know, stop the hate, impeach Trump. And so I was able to pull two or three people aside and this one couple, they're atheists as they identified, but they were just dumbfounded with how can Christians support this man? You know, from what we understand of Christianity, he seems to be the antithesis of it. And, and, and they, you know, they just said, we don't get it because, you know, Jesus and what we understand of Jesus, it's, it's, there's love and there's forgiveness and grace. And we just don't see any of that. So like what Brian mentioned with his friend on the Camino, I think people are, are waiting and watching for something alternative. And, and unfortunately, um, the evangelical church, not entirely, but so many have been conflated with with what's going on in politics and and we feature a song by Daniel Diedrich I don't know if you're familiar with that Stuart the hymn for the 81 percent mm -hmm. um he had so many That's comments that I read through. moments in the documentary mm -hmm. Dave, as far as I'm concerned when I don't I won't give it away but I mean where you place that song and how it comes in mm -hmm. man it moves me every time I see it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, me too. And and that was one of those, we, we wanted to use it. We talked to Daniel Diedrich. He said, yeah, you can make a music video. We traveled out to his place in Indiana. We made it. And we weren't even sure where it was going to go in the film. But as often happens in the editing process, it's like, oh, it wants to go here. <laughs> and when it said, I want to go here, and we put it in there, it was just like, whoa, that works. Um I think it's so, the most powerful moment of the documentary for me hmm. when that song comes in. Yeah. Well, when we, yeah, to me, it's an altar call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an altar call, that moment, um, quite literally. And you'll see when you watch the film, Stuart, what, what we're talking about. Yeah, don't uh, give it away, David. I, don't, I know. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait to be able to see this. Now, um, for like one of the last, like, I just have like just two more questions for you guys. And when we look at this, and as, as you kind of look across like the past couple of years, uh, as we look across your guys' experience, putting all this together, traveling around, seeing America, talking to people, I mean, for me, it's, it feels like Trump is merely just a symptom of, of, of a deeper problem. You know, it, it appears that he kind of, I feel like, rushed a, a lot of other crap uh, together quicker maybe than it would have without him. But but with the world where we're at today, with how fractured we're at, with where the place the church is at, I was going to ask each of you guys this. Where do you see what is happening next on the horizon? Where do you see things unfolding next? Hmm. Who was it? Niles Bohr said prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It does feel like 
I mean, your, your question makes sense because it does feel like we're coming to the end of something. That, that something has um, reached a ludicrous level of absurdity and it can't continue for much longer. Uh, I agree that Trump is a symptom, um, but it took someone like him to turn religious right into almost a farcical cult of personality. Um, so I, I think that's eventually going to lose its steam. I think part of what happens is I think um, Christian witness in America recedes for a while. I, I think we deserve to be in timeout for a while. Um, <laughs> first of all, I think first of all, I think America is much. It has been for a long time much more secular than we think. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to Europe. I go to Europe a lot, at least I used to. And, uh, you know, it's kind of considered conventional wisdom that, that Europe, especially, you know, Western Europe is very secular while Christianity still has currency in America. I, I, I want to push back on that. Uh, the Christians I do meet in Europe seem to have a level of seriousness about them that I don't find common in the U.S. I think what we have in the U.S. is we have civil religion, and that's, you know, part of what we deal with in both the book and the document and what we mean by that, that civil religion, where the true object of worship is actually the state, the nation, the empire, not Christ, although there's a conflation of the, of the terminology that makes it confusing for people. But I think civil religion in America is still powerful, but it, that, that in itself is secular in nature. And, and once that has finally reached its end, it's, it's, it's exhausted itself in the form of Trumpism and whatever maybe a little bit comes after, then I think we're going to be aware, oh, America's way more secular than I thought. So, so when I'm in Europe, I'm always aware of deep Christian roots. Now, they're, they're largely forgotten, uh, but they're there. When I'm in America, I see a thin veneer of civil religion that really doesn't have much rootedness in historic Christianity at all. So if you're asking me what I think is going to happen, I think a, a decade or two down the road, there's going to be a coming to grips with the fact that, wow, America is a whole lot more secular than we imagined. That it turns out Mayberry was a lot more pagan than we ever understood. <laughs> Something mm. like that. Mm. David and Kathy, what about you guys? What, what do you see kind of happening as you've experienced all this and as you've traveled around America? What, what do you kind of see is on the horizon? Yeah, I think um, we, we did a film um, we finished in, in 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And as we interviewed people, and, and I certainly learned far more about church history, that it seems like every 500 years since Christ, there's been like a reformation, a, a change. You know, we, we use the word apocalypse as, you know, destruction, but it really is about revealing. And, and it seemed like there's been, so you had the fall of the, Rome, the crumbling of the Roman Empire, and the rise of the Byzantine Empire, and then, you know, fifth, sixth century, and then, of course, the east-west split of the church in the in 11th century, and then, of course, the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago, and now it just seems like we're in a new Reformation, and there, it just seems like it's, it's emerging, it's percolating, it's not coming from the top down, it's, it's emerging, the thoughts are coming out there, thought leaders are, are giving us a, a new message. And that's one reason we love being able to have Brian on the Camino because it really fit this notion of a prophet in the wilderness giving us uh, a message. Um, so I feel, yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that's, that's hopeful that something's being revealed and it's showing a deep issue and a deep problem, but at the same time, there can be hope now for something new mm -hmm. and that we can find each other um, find those that are resonating with what seems to be a more beautiful way of pursuing the way of Christ. And let's work together to live that out. And like Brian said earlier, it may be that we just have to listen for 
maybe 20 or 30 years, Kathy said 10, um, certainly as it relates to racism, I realized I just need to shut up and listen, not judge how mad someone is or what they should or shouldn't be doing. I just haven't listened. And, and this 2020 was like a, a complete wake up call for me in terms of I'd never read about liberation theology. I didn't know anything about James Cone. And, and as I've studied, and it's like, oh, wow, how could I not know this? It's so important. And you know we have a section on racism in the film and that we weren't sure how to even approach it, but I, I think we were able to create something that, that is on point and will hopefully get people to think in a different way because it would just be a launching point of realizing there's a lot we've got to learn. So I, I think I'm hopeful that there's people that are ready to learn about a um, not a new way, but really getting back to what was the original intent of the church. Yeah. When you asked the, the question, Stuart, the mm -hmm. phrase popped into my mind, a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. I think Indeed. there's there's really no other future than that. And I think it starts with each of us individually. I think we desperately need to pray and ask God to heal the the pain that we've caused mm. and to help us to prevent from dealing pain in the future. And I think mm. that only comes from an individual come to Jesus moment. I think that's where our hope lies. Mm. Yeah, without irony, we need to evangelize Christians. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good word. Um, well, yeah. my last question is for the directors. And, um, okay, so in some of the clips I, I've watched, I have seen, I've seen what Brian looks like on the Camino. He's, 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 it's a little rough. It's like a little grizzly Adams. <laughs> he's he's yeah, you know, yeah, kind yeah. of thing going for him. So I think, oh man, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. So I've, I've watched enough movies to know um, that usually at some point, like, and here's what I'm wondering, is there going to be a point where there's like a montage where you give Brian a makeover, like a shave and a new hairstyle. And now everyone in high school thinks he's hot. <laughs> is there going to be one of those moments at the end of the film where they're like, Oh wow, look at him. He's beautiful. They're filmmakers, not magicians. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brian has a look, and what you're seeing now is what we saw on the Camino, pretty much. <laughs> no. He wore the same clothes. Well, he has two shirts, mm. right? And you kind of alternated the two. Carrying everything on my back. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Kathy and I, we were basically, what we would do is we had a car. We would walk all day and then take a taxi back to get our car and then drive it to the next location mm. because we had suitcases and camera gear and Brian had his his backpack mm. so we kind of had the luxury of all of our stuff where you know he opted to just um hearing something yeah. he opted just to have what was on his back gotcha um, so which is that so where yeah. is Kathy got the word odious from is that is that true <laughs> 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 no, I kid. I kid. So, uh, fortunately, they were walking in cool weather, yeah. more than even okay. rainy weather. Let me tell you, right. you can you can be odious on the Camino about you know hour six when it's ninety degrees out. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But we we would have to chase Brian down though, because like <laughs> once he gets started, he's on the move. Yeah. So so there were times you know because I would ask him, okay, Brian, like just like three times if we can stop you today. But there were times when literally I was pulling my drone out, getting it all set up. I'd plop it on the ground. We'd get it up in the air, and then I would chase him down with the drone, and we'd land it, run to catch back up with him. Um, but then you know, there was often where we would be walking beside him, and just we'd put a mic on him and just let him talk. Mm. In fact, we probably have three hours of him <laughs> on the Camino talking about some really interesting stuff. It wouldn't make it in the film, but I thought maybe we should just release that. The Camino um, tapes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you and say you could, released that, is that more like riff. blackmail, um, <laughs> or is that? Well, he, we did get him riffing Bob Dylan, you know, <laughs> and there was a couple, to do. You know, a couple Dil Dylan lyric riffs that he said, "Now you can't ever let anyone hear me say this." Um, but anyway, we had fun. Well, awesome. I, I really appreciate all of you guys and your time for being here today. And Postcards from Babylon: The Church in American Exile will be exclusively streaming live on January the twenty-first. 7 p.m. local times, um, and you can find more all information. All time zones. All time zones, yeah. And it's going to be at postcardsdoc.com. Is that the best place to find stuff, or where Where do you want us to well, go? Well, if you go to live.postcardsdoc.com, that's where you can buy tickets. Okay. 
You can buy tickets. You can buy individual tickets. You can get group tickets. Um, so if we can get you that link and you can maybe put that. Absolutely. It'll be in there. The It'll be in there. And so, and so what's okay. cool, what I've heard you guys are doing too, you're, you're premiering it, but then you're also with, uh, with Keith Giles going to be having a discussion um, afterwards about that. Is that true? Yeah. 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 So he's hosting it. Keith, and we're going to have uh, Kristen Dume, mm -hmm. Shane Claiborne, Lisa Sharon Harper. Uh, we were hoping to have Walter on the call, but but he couldn't make it. And then Brian, Kathy, and I, and then uh, Pete Weiner at the last minute has agreed to uh, join us. And I really felt strongly about him because he's a conservative. You know, he was um, part of the Trump or the uh, Bush White House, uh, our speechwriter. So he's been at the heart of evangelical Christian. Republican uh, movement and has become a very open critic. He, he writes a lot for the Atlantic and um, the New Yorker and is just a, a brilliant, kind uh, man. So, Well, I'm excited so much for all of this and for what, what comes next after this. Um, I look forward to watching it uh, along with everyone else listening here. I think we're all excited about this. And so, yeah, I want to thank all of you for yeah, your time today, you. man. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kathy, for your time. Um, thank you, Stuart. Absolutely. I, I'm really excited about what's going to happen next. So much thanks from the talents and crew from Postcards from Babylon. If you want to find out more information uh, about this documentary, Postcards Doc, that's postcardsdoc.com. And if you want to be able to get tickets, live.postcardsdoc.com. I'm going to be watching. Hope you're going to be watching with me. And one final thing I wanted to talk about this hour, and this is this is something that I'm going to say I have a unique perspective to add here. And also, I just tend to get a little bit pissed off at people oversimplifying issues that are happening. Uh, over this past week, we have seen the president of the United States deplatformed from Twitter and Facebook. We've also seen Parler, the Republican circle jerk of an app, uh, also pulled from Amazon servers and gone dark. And I've heard many people out there whine and cra carry on about, this is censorship. This is what it's going to be like in China. Well, guess what? If anyone remembers, I've talked about this just a few times. Me, your host, Stuart, I'm an ESL teacher. Do you know what types of students I teach? I teach adults and children in mainland China and Taiwan and Japan. And I had an old student of mine over the last weekend, messaged me, uh, who I haven't talked to in a while. He messaged me, honestly, just saying, are you okay? How are you after <laughs> what happened at the Capitol? And we had a great conversation about what censorship really looks like. And when people start saying that we're about to be censored like they are in China, that is... Mm, that's not true. That's not true at all. When we talk about censorship, aka deplatforming a bunch of racist hillbillies or racist millionaires, people can get upset. But that is not censorship. That's really just the consequences of freedom of speech. Censorship, as my former student would tell me, is when you happen to criticize the president of China, and then three weeks later, people arrive at your house and take you off to jail. That's censorship. This, this is an inconvenience. So let's put Orwell back in our pants or book or tuck him away wherever he's supposed to be because he doesn't really apply fully right here right now. This ain't censorship. This is consequences of our actions and our words, which are not also covered in the First Amendment. No, no, no. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. And I shall end my rant there. I hope you all are doing well and surviving in this weird and perilous time. But before I send you off, just a reminder to subscribe and give Snarky Faith a review over on iTunes. It helps us get the word out to new listeners. And if you want to reach out to me directly, hit me up at questions at snarkyfaith.com. Thank you for being a part of the show week after week. I appreciate you all. And as we, as we prepare to enter into this crazy, chaotic world that is wild and unhinged at times, I release you out into the world and I send you with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark. May we be able to be a people 
that contemplate deeply, that study our own motives well, that critique and temper our speech and our actions. And may we be a foretaste of Jesus to a world where Christianity tastes like shit. I know it sounds like a lot. I know it sounds like a lot. But it's exactly what we're called to do. It's exactly what we are called to do. May we that follow in the ways and teachings of Jesus be agents of healing in this world. Be agents that give dignity to those that need voice and affirmation, that build up those that need to realize that they are worthy of God's love. So get to work, get out there, and go do great things. I will catch you guys again next week. I'm out of here. Peace. Peace.